Welcome to VM Blog's coverage of KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe taking place in London. I'm Brian Ducharme, and I'm here with David Marshall. And we have with us as a guest, Betty Junod, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Heroku at Salesforce. Welcome. Hi, good to see you too. Um, for people that have not heard of Heroku, uh, maybe you can kind of start by kicking things off and giving us a company overview. Yeah, so Heroku is a platform as a service. Um, we've been around since 2007, and we've been part of the Salesforce portfolio since about 2011. Platform as a service meaning that we have developer tooling, the software delivery lifecycle, and the infrastructure all wrapped up into a nice package. So that's really focusing on um, helping people um, build, deploy, and scale uh, faster for all their applications. Now, for a KubeCon attendee who might be listening to this video, can you talk a little bit about what specific problems they may be facing at their company uh, that your company solves for them? Yeah, um, and that is a great question because, you know, when you look at um, KubeCon and, you know, you and I, we've been attending these for many, many years, is that the ecosystem of projects, the ecosystem of technologies around uh, Kubernetes has grown exponentially because, you know what, once Kubernetes became the standard, we then had to had to go and solve all the all the bits around the infrastructure um, for a cloud native construct aligned to the Kubernetes API. You look at the landscape, that turns into like hundreds of projects, hundreds of point solutions, lots of tools. Uh, somehow that all has to come together into a platform experience, right? Uh, many companies are looking at this today like, okay, there's, I see all the options for observability, which one do I pick? Um, I see all these options for developer experience, what do I pick? And then you have to wrap that around um, the Kubernetes distribution of your choice. What we do at Heroku is really about taking all that stuff together, integrating it with a set of opinions. And those opinions are formed from our 12-factor app uh, methodology. And then we deliver that to customers as a service. So um, the value line of where they spend their time is really focused on the things that align to what they're trying to do for their companies is building and delivering digital products, the apps, uh, the apps, the web apps, the mobile apps, the backend services that you know power either their uh, power all of their customer experiences and automate a lot of their internal business processes. So, Betty, could you kind of walk us through a real-world customer success story that kind of showcases the impact of your technology? Yeah, so we have, um, first off, um, the Heroku customer is uh, across every sort of customer size, um, from the brand new startups to large enterprise and across all different kinds of industries. So let me give you a couple of examples is um, Health, Health Sherpa has been a customer of ours for a while. Um, they actually run the Affordable Care Act um, enrollment on Heroku. And as you know, with insurance is it's large, it's 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 a largely kind of um, uh, consistent you know, um, kind of volume, but then there are some very peak times where it's just, it's just the scale has to go, it goes through the roof. They're able to build a great experience in order to uh, enroll new members and be able to handle that volume without, um, without impact to their customer experience. And so, um, you know, they, they sign up like tens of thousands of people. There's tens of thousands of requests that happen in a very short window um, without impacting the response time or that user experience. So that's a kind of example of something that's running on Heroku. Um, we also have like large parts of Salesforce um, run on Heroku. Um, those of you who those of you who are um, familiar with the Salesforce ecosystem, the whole Trailblazer Trailhead, which is really our, it's kind of like a huge LMS um, along with like badging. Um, um, that whole system um, runs on Heroku, and it has it touches into so many internal and external systems because we're managing like. I think there's like hundreds of thousands of people that go through that, um, both that are employees as well as within our community. And so lots of services that are running in Salesforce and on Heroku working together to deliver a very um, rich uh, online web experience, as well as a, a completely um, seamless to the mobile experience. And it's also integrated in Slack for us as employees. So that kind of um, application. Um, and then another great example is um, uh, they spoke at Dreamforce last year, but someone like Lamborghini 
right? So you're like, okay, what is a car company going to do with Heroku? Well, when customers order a Lamborghini, it actually takes them two years from when they order to get when they get the car. So keeping the customer engaged through that process is super important because, you know, this is a, this is a, a very, this is a, this is a high ticket item car. So what they've done is built this really customized, personalized uh, mobile application that actually allows the buyer to follow the journey of their car throughout the entire build process. They can see it in the factory. They can see where it is. They can pick colors from it. But then it's also connected to a whole bunch of systems on the back end. Um, behind the scenes, like, um, you know, they were using an, their, their CRM, right, from Salesforce, um, some other services they have in AWS, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so when you think about it, it's any organization that really wants to focus on, like, the, the part of, like, it's really about building the app experience. How do I build the right experience for my customer or my employee um, in a way that gives me the freedom and flexibility to use whatever programming language I want, as well as be able to make it as customized as I want? Um, and to be have like a hyper responsive and scalable environment. Now you said it a bit earlier. The uh, KubeCon has been around for many years now. It's grown uh, tremendously since the very beginning. Uh, and you also said there's going to be a lot of projects on display. There's going to be a lot of vendors showcasing their technologies on the show floor. What differentiates Heroku, uh, your technology? from, you know, the noise that's that's going to be there on the show floor? What makes you guys unique? Yeah, um, that is a great question. And what I'll say is um, I love the explosion in the ecosystem um, because I think it validates like and also solidifies this model um, and this, arch this type of architecture um, for the entire IT community. I think what's hard for a lot of companies is that it can get very complex because there's a lot to choose from. And then there, then you have to figure out how you're going to piece it together if you're doing DIY. Um, and then lifecycle managing each component and doing the integration. Um, I think there's really the question around, um, you have highly skilled res uh, engineering resources, uh, employees, and is that the most high value use of their time? What else could they be doing to drive value? So our position is that, um, and the differentiation that we do is like we bring a lot of those components into a experience where we take on the burden um, of building it, integrating it, managing it, and then adding automation with the certain opinions on how things scale, how things are configured, um, and provide that as, an, as a um, uh, service experience for the customer. Uh, I'm gonna use the, uh, the analogy I'm gonna use is, you know, we used to all build our own data centers. We'd lease space. We would be putting in electricity, racking and stacking. And then someone's going around like, you know, remember the days of like someone's got a USB key and going around and updating each server? Like that wasn't that long ago. But for the vast majority of people, they don't do that today. They, they, you know, you still have infrastructure engineers. They're kind of like deep, uh, deep experts in like an AWS um, and how best to like leverage all the components from the cloud. Um, if you think about what Heroku is doing, we're doing that, but at that platform layer that needs to sit above just the raw infrastructure services and individual components. Um, and then putting a developer experience in front of it. Ask any cloud engineer if they would give their developers direct access to the um, AWS console. To provision whatever you want. Go do your thing. Probably not, right? Because the um, infrastructure and the security engineers, there's their specialists in those in um, and how those are provisioned and governed, right? Those policies, and the developers are focused. Uh, they're experts in you know writing business logic, the languages and frameworks that they're skilled in. So what we're trying to do is like help scale what those um, help scale what those infrastructure and platform engineers can do by having some of that you know, lower level heavy lifting taken care of by the platform. Now, kind of sticking around the uh, discussion around your technology, what are some of the uh, specific innovations and features that you'll be highlighting at your booth? And is there anything else that uh, attendees should know that we haven't already talked about? Yeah, so um, we've been talking about this uh, for a little bit, and we um, <clears throat> announced it at announced the pilots of these new innovations um, back in December. But we are replatforming the Great Platform, so like that's a big thing for us. You know, we are running 
you know, we have like launched like billions of applications have been launched and run on Heroku over this, you know, decade or so. Um, and they've been working great. Um, however, the containerization containers and the orchestration inside of Heroku, that was all homegrown because it was built before Docker and Kubernetes existed. Um, and in some ways it was like, it wasn't broke, so we didn't have to fix it. Um, but, you know, we're... We're in this. We're in the process of replatforming the replatforming the platform. And what we announced in December that we're going to showcase in the booth is we have um, we're moving to Kubernetes. So that's um, live in pilot today. We have lots of customers testing it out. Kubernetes, Open Telemetry, uh, cloud native build packs, and the OCI. So we have the standardized container format. Now, like. C customers don't get like the the users when they log in or when they are doing their git push Roku um, to deploy their containers, they're not going to be interacting with the Kubernetes API, right? So it kind of to them it's like, does it matter that it's in there? It matters to us in in that then our platform is now available um, to kind of like the modern the current ecosystem of things, and so then we can bring more we can bring more of that into the platform for the customers to be able to consume because. The value is not in for them is not in building the thing is to consume those capabilities. The addition of open telemetry now allows um, customers who are using additional um, tooling to then be able to plug Heroku into that so that they can get all that um, uh, the, the traces and the metrics and logs into other tools, as well as see richer, um, uh, richer data on their application performance from within Heroku. So a lot of good things there. And we've expanded support for um, uh, language support. So now we've added uh, .NET. Um, and then we just recently announced um, VS Code extension. So continuing to add things on the developer experience, updating the platform to all the, to, to, to all the things in the cloud native ecosystem. Um, and then we've been, we also added um, managed inference in agents. So we are, Heroku is built on AWS, um, AWS, and so we've now brought in um, uh, Bedrock so that from the same simple like Heroku developer experience, consistent commands and structure, they're, the developers are now able to add the language model of their choice without having to switch context. Now, what do you think are some of the key trends that you're seeing take shape in 2025 and beyond? And and how is it uh, affecting your roadmap? You know, how do those trends align with what uh, your team is uh, is developing? So I hear there's this little thing called AI that everybody's been um, talking about. I don't know. Have you heard about it? <laughs> I, I might have heard of a thing or two, yeah. AI and agents and all that stuff. Um, so uh, that's kind of a focus because in in you know, there's apps and services, but then I think, you know, agents are are also a form of software, right? Um, just they're doing more intelligent things and they're a little more flexible than um, kind of like the uh, just pure like business logic that we wrote before. So that's, um, as we look at that, really it, the same questions arise like, okay, there's a whole new set of tooling new sets of data and then new types of things that we'll have to, um, uh, that the developers and teams are gonna have to figure out how to use. I mean, we can, our fundamentals are really around like having a platform uh, platform approach. So that like the, the, and really gearing it towards like, who's the builder, right? So we wanna keep the experience simple for the builder. We wanna streamline, we wanna provide an integrated and automated operational experience so that Hey, there's more tools always coming out, but it's not going to add more overhead for you, right? Um, and then be able to bring all, um, br but bring these, um, bring this tooling and these integrations into the platform so that um, you know the builders are able to build more new and interesting things. So we've always had a lot of um, data. Uh, we have data services like Kafka, um, uh, Postgres, and um, key value stores. Um, we run one of the largest managed Postgres instances out there. Um, um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very popular um, aspect. Um, and having the underlying platform move to Kubernetes, I mean, it really aligns well with the trends we're seeing on Kubernetes being kind of a default mode for all of the data intensive applications, whether they be databases themselves or ML or AI based workloads. I guess one last thing before we uh, close this, what kind of message would you like attendees to take away after visiting your company's booth? 
um, that we have great purple stuff. So that, <laughs> um, so actually it, it's, um, so swag, we're gonna have some great swag, but the demos are really in everything that when they see is about the simplicity in their experience to do very powerful things in what they build. Um, so I think that's the key message. We're trying to simplify what's complex, help them get to their outcomes, the, uh, their finish line faster, and do it in a way that's sustainable over time because it's not going to add a whole bunch of overhead to their daily operations. So how do folks who are attending come by and get these great demos and grab some great purple swag? And if they're not attending, uh, you know, where can they go to find out more information about all the great things that you talked about? Yeah, so we are going to be at Booth S250. Um, that is somewhere on the map, maybe, you know, on the map of the KubeCon floor. Um, and then we will be hosting, a, if you're coming on site, we're going to have a happy hour that we're co-hosting with our partners, AWS. Um, and then if you are unable to attend or not going to this KubeCon, well, we will be also in Atlanta. But in the interim, just go to Heroku.com and see the latest blogs, check out our developer center. You can sign up and log into the product, um, all kinds of things. Great. Betty, thank you. It's always a pleasure uh, to have you talk with us at VM Blog, and we wish you and your team a very successful event. Thanks so much, David and Brian. Good to see you guys. You too. Thank you. you.